Hello, beautiful people. I'm back again. If you just so happen to see that little blooper, if you did not, good. <laughs> um, I'm here and I am getting ready to work on a very special piece for a very special client. And I'm not going to give too much information because I'm not going to give too much information because that person might watch this and I don't want them to know that this is theirs that I'm working on. So, as if you tuned in yesterday and then you saw that lovely piece, Miss Estefani, I'll drag her in a little bit more so you can see her. Miss Estefani, you saw me working on her yesterday. She has sold. This is an 11 by a 14 size canvas. If you would like to order one yourself, you can. Just let me know. Uh... So if you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you do not miss when we go live or have any special premiere videos. Also, you can um, like this video, share it, and you can comment. I can see some of your comments if you're going to say anything. I might ask you questions. But today, I'm just going to be letting the word play, and I will be painting. You'll get to see. And I will reveal what this is down here that I'm touching in just a moment. So, we did this yesterday. I'm going to walk you through. It's a little difficult down here. <laughs> this is in my normal painting area. So, bear with me, please. <laughs> it's a little difficult trying to, you know, maneuver, be in the camera, paint and everything. I'll just have to move that back up when I show you guys. So quick, very quick, take out your smartphone, go to the YouTube, if, well, you're already here on YouTube, and you're going to click on the share, and this takes less than a minute, if your internet's working correctly, take less than a minute, copy link, you're going to go to your Facebook and say, watch with me. Watch with me. Smiley face. And post the link. And share. And share. And done. Okay, so what I would like for you all to do now is just tune in your ears. If you're painting today and you're here and you just want to enjoy the word, whatever I'm going to share today and watch me, this is just something to share, show with you guys what I'm doing and the behind the scenes. So you're going to see everything that's normally taken out of a video. And honestly, I probably would have restarted this a third time already. <laughs> but I'm just going to go ahead and keep going. And this is my gift to you. You get to see all the behind the scenes and everything that's going on. And yeah, so today I'm going to be using my iPad to bring up some Stephen Furtick. How many of you guys like Stephen Furtick? Wonderful, wonderful, phenomenal pastor. And I love how he just speaks and shares on family a lot and just real life things and gets you thinking and not afraid to speak his mind according to the words. So. going to get that up and he's got one on here from his wife but which would be nice I'm gonna click on it. Okay. how to reset your heart that is what oh that's only 16 minutes we're gonna go back but it could keep on playing so this first one is how to reset your heart with Stephen Furtick so Elevation sir, Church I my heart it has to happen within not just the behavior but the belief that drives the behavior has to change or the change won't stay we found this out over and over again every new year we learn it again and so lasting change is what i'm after and i incline my heart interesting choice of words if you incline something that means that it was naturally not in that position that means you had to act upon it in order to orient it in a different direction, right? So we don't incline something that's already upright. Must have meant that his heart was declined. And the problem with a lot of us 
as we go through life recline. That is just however we wake up, that's how we stay. However we feel, that's how we act. The psalmist said, I act upon my attitude and I incline my heart. Did you know you're in charge of your heart? Quit saying people broke your heart. They can't break it if you don't give it to them. Hey, hey. And so he said, I'm setting my heart in the direction of heaven. I wonder, is your heart set in a divine direction today? Incline my heart. I don't think this is something you do like one time, you know? You just incline your heart to God when you were 12 in summer Bible camp and you never were tempted again. I would want it to be that way. I want it to be like the infomercial. Do you remember the infomercial with the rotisserie, showtime rotisserie oven? And the man says, set it and, and forget it. That's how I want my heart to be, like that infomercial. Set it and forget it. I want my heart to just stay there, you know? Just, hey, I went to church first Sunday in January. That ought to get me by. I, I said it, but the psalmist said it's not enough to set it and forget it. He said it, it's more like you set it, you check it, you reset it, you check it, because all through your day and all through your year, your heart is going to be tempted to decline to a default position. And maybe it's a default position of discouragement or despair or dysfunction. But when you take charge of your heart, touch your neighbor, say, take charge of your heart. Take charge of your heart. That's what the writer of Proverbs said. It's not, it's not just the psalmist that did it. The writer of Proverbs said, guard your heart. It's your heart. And that's where the issues of life flow from. So before we can get the windows working, we got to get our hearts open. Hey, yeah, that's the doctor true. was fussing at me a couple months ago about my cholesterol. <laughs> Listen, I'm getting on up there in age. I've never had a conversation like this with the doctor before. And he just talk and talk, blah, 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 LDL, HDL, triglyceride, all this stuff. So, and I know we could tell he wasn't getting through to me because he took a real drastic turn. He said, hey, I don't want you to be one of those guys who looks real fit on the outside, which made me feel happy that he said that about me. So, but then one day you're just outside running and you just fall over of a heart attack. And to listen to me. And I, I corrected him. I said, doctor, I know you got some degrees that I don't have and all that, but you're wrong about that. I don't run. <laughs> so if I fall over, it's not going to be <laughs> on cardio, but... He said, you can be blocked on the inside, look good on the outside, wow, wow, wow. and be successful and fall over, and be sexy and fall over, yeah. and be married and fall over. Come on, get a promotion and fall over. Be religious and fall over. It has to happen in the heart, but it doesn't start with the heart. It starts with the habits, your habits. Create and what you think about of your heart. What's in your mind? It is good. Every once in a while, you gotta stop and clap for the work God speaks to you. I feel like God is going to help somebody set your heart on things above. Yeah. Get your heart set in the right direction, but it's gonna require some habits, and they're all right there in the psalm. I, I want to read you. The next two verses, because my three habits are right there in the verses. Forever to the end, I set my heart to perform your statutes. I hate, this is 113, I hate, I hate, what's that word doing in the Bible? I thought we were supposed to love everything. No, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. I don't think we should go on until we talk about that. He said, I hate this. I hate the double-minded. I hate, that's not a person I hate, it's I hate the condition of double-mindedness. I, I hate it, and, and see, the, the, thing about, the thing about hate is, um, hate is the most powerful motivation to change, not love. And so before you start 
with wanting to reach your goals, maybe the first thing for you to do is, is to make a decision about some things that you hate. And it's going to be complicated because, you know, as for me, I have a love-hate relationship with some of the things. I, I feel kind of like David. Uh, one time David's son Absalom died, and Joab came to him. He said, your son is dead. And David started weeping. And Joab was mad because Absalom was trying to take the throne from David. And so Absalom had become David's enemy. But David's heart was connected to Absalom. So he was crying, and Joab said, you need to get it together. You hate those who love you, and you love those who hate you. You hate what's trying to deliver you, and you love what's trying to destroy you. And I feel that way about certain things in my life, certain actions, certain behaviors in my life. I, I love how they feel for a minute, but I hate the crash. And certain things in my life, I hate how they feel when I'm doing them. I hate the plank. <laughs> Exhibit A, I mean, I, I was, for years, I was one of these people, I would tell you to your face, I hate to exercise. You can go back and watch my sermon videos from three years ago. I would stand on the stage and say, I hate to exercise. You know why I hated it? Because it wasn't a habit. I didn't do it enough to love it. I hated it. But you don't have to accept your default attitude toward anything. No. I incline my heart. I'm going to teach today. You came out, I'm going to make it worth your while. I'm going to teach today. Get that elevation pin ready. We're going to burn it up today and get a new one next week. I grew, I grew to hate. I think the moment of realization for me was when I was paying Andy $450 to come over to my house and let my pants out. I hated it. I looked at Andy and I said, I hate this man. I could be using this money to buy new clothes and I'm paying it to you to make my clothes bigger. I hate this. And he said, hey, keep eating. It's job security for me. That's what my tailor said. I said, no, man, I hate this. I wow. hate this feeling. And, and sometimes, sometimes before you can make a change, you have to be motivated by, I know it's a strong word, it's not very pastoral. You have to hate it. Yeah. You have to hate it. You have to, you have to hate self-pity. And the problem with hating self-pity is, Hello. it feels good like a bag of burritos on your tongue. See, it's not that I hate the taste of Doritos. I just hated what it did to my waist. This is so good. It sounds simple, but it's real deep. He said, I hate the double-minded. I love your law. Before I can do what I love, I have to know what to hate. I hate this. I I hate the way, I, I hate the way, watch, watch. I, I love what it does for me, but I hate what it does to me. It's a complicated relationship. I, a bag of Doritos does something for me. I, it might not do anything for you. It does something for me. I have a long-standing relationship with carbohydrates. <laughs> they have been there for me in the midnight hour when I couldn't call on anybody else. I could call on chocolate. So I love it. But I hate. I love what it does for me, but I hate what it does to me. Yeah. I hate all this. A lot of y'all in relationships like anger. that. Oh, it makes me feel good. It even gets me some results. I have a complicated relationship with anger. If you get mad enough, you get people to do what you want, but then you're all alone after they do it. Nobody wants to be with you. Well, I hate being angry because I hate being alone. Somebody shout outcome. Uh, I hate the outcome of this and that. I, I hate it. I, I hate what it does to my marriage. I hate what it does to my relationships. I hate how it disturbs my inner peace and puts me in a state of turmoil. And, and it's complicated. It's, it's a complicated relationship that I have with complaining. I love to complain. Ooh, I love to tell somebody. I love I, You can look at there at me when the Bible says it's going to do it. The Bible says it's going to do it, but it didn't say it doesn't feel good. Amen. It doesn't feel good to complain. It feels like a choice morsel going down. 
I mean, just as it's coming out of your mouth, just to unload on them. When somebody says, how are you doing? Just let them know for five minutes. Every hate, every pain, every oh my gosh. <laughs> every struggle. But guess what? The next time they see you coming, they're going the other way. Because it's, it's, it's the law of diminishing returns. It gets you high for a minute. I love to talk bad about people. I do. I shouldn't say these things. I tell myself oh every my week gosh. after I finish on Sunday when I'm watching back my sermon verdict, don't say stuff like that. People put it on YouTube and use it against you as a weapon. But I just got to tell you, I, I love. It makes me feel really good about my dysfunction to spend a little time discussing yours. I love to talk about other people's dumb decisions. I love it. It's just it's a natural high. Because if I can get you down here, then I feel right like I'm right here. Only problem is I'm setting myself up for decline. Mm. And now the next time I see you, I can't treat you better than I talk about you. Mm. So it ruins my relationships. I, I love what it does for me. It does something for me. Come on, how many will admit it does something for you to talk about what Henry did and what Susie wore and what they should have done and what their kids are like, but it but by the same measure you judge, you will be judged. I love the fix, <laughs> but I hate the outcome. I hate it. The problem with a lot of our resolutions for change is that they are not motivated by a healthy kind of hate. Healthy hate, yeah. There, there is a healthy way to hate. I hate racism. Yeah. I hate poverty. Yeah. That's the only thing that will motivate me to do anything about it, is I've got to hate it. I yep. hate bullying. Yeah. I too. hate bullying. I was bullied. Tony Wigfall jacked me up against the wall. I still remember my head cracking against the wall. And my oh friend my Hamilton God. looking at me saying, don't look at me, man. I still remember the view from up there. And I can't see somebody being picked on without seeing myself from up there just wondering, is this guy going to break my wow. face? I hate it. I hate it. I was not physically to me the other day. bullied, said, but I, I was verbally bullied. bullied. She didn't say I love being early because she doesn't. But you got to get to the point. We were going to see somebody. She said, I don't want to walk in like that. And until you hate being late more than you love hitting snooze, you won't make the change. Yeah. Get that thing on your mind, that bag of Doritos, and say, I hate it. Look at your neighbor and say, I hate it. Not I hate you, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate the double mind. I hate indecision. I hate it. I, I'd rather make a bad decision than make no decision. Mm. I hate procrastination. I hate it. I did it a lot, but I finally got to the point where I hate it. Now, I hate the discipline of preparation, too. Hell yeah. But I hate the pain of procrastination more than I yeah. hate. Yeah. Yep. That's right, Purdy. I, I, I hate it. And I just said to somebody the other day, I said, I never thought I'd hear myself say this, and I used to hate people who said this. I think I like exercise. After three years of doing it, five days a week and finding out what works for me, I think I'm one of those people that I used to roll my eyes at. I, think I like to exercise. I think I've reset my heart. I declare a reset. I Amen. declare a reset. There are some things in your life that have been on the decline, but God brought you to church on the first weekend of the year, and you're setting your heart in a different direction. Come on, you're going to love the presence of God this year. You're going to love the word Amen. of God this year. You're going to love the right things this year. Train your brain. Train. To hate it. Train your brain. I, I know that's what my dad was trying to do when he made us eat all the food on our plate when we overfilled it at the at Ryan's buffet. <laughs> Vacation memories. He said, you're going to eat every bite on that plate. 
And me and my brother took turns causing diversions while the other ones stuffed our pockets. And we walked out of Ryan's with pockets full of food. Never forget it. He wanted me to have an association. He said, I want you to hate waste. Maybe that's why sometimes God lets us get so low. So I hate it. So I would despise wow. Egypt because if I didn't despise it, I would be tempted to go back. Hey, thank you for watching. Wow. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this video with a friend. And don't forget, you can join me live every Sunday. Thanks again for watching. Well, I spoke of her earlier, Holly Furtick. She's up next. More than miracles. Are you excited about God's word today? Holly's going to preach, but before she does, no, hold on, I didn't tell you this. She's walking toward the stage. Stay there. I want to bring up, both of the boys are wearing a suit. Graham's is, is safety pinned because the tailor is quarantined. It's safety pinned at the bottom, so don't look at that. And Elijah had some yogurt on this lapel, but I think we baby wiped it off, and Abby looks perfect like she always does. So you come on, on up for a minute, and Abby's <laughs> going to introduce you. So handsome. so handsome. I love that Furtick includes his wife so good. and so other good. speakers hey, to speak. Equip right, other ahead, people underneath you so that your legacy lives so on. Ready. And honestly, okay, just equipping other people to speak and to be the ministers. We all are all the ministers. All right, you hold her mic. Then you go on the other side. You hold her hand. And just face right that way. We're always about to come up. Don't, don't step back. The table's coming. I did that one time. I tripped um, over that table so bad. Did you bring it out the week I tripped over it? Six feet, six feet, six feet. Did you? <laughs> Thank God for your biceps, man. All right. Creatine on quarantine, haven't you? <laughs> Creatine on quarantine. Anyway, just hold that mic. You want to hold it yourself? You know, hold it. Hold hand, boy. What's wrong with you? You want to hold his hand? <laughs> All right, just read the thing. <laughs> I want to tell you a little about my mom before she preaches to you today. You probably already know that she likes to read, but I bet you didn't know that she doesn't read the books on paper, but she listens to them on Audible. She probably doesn't want you to know that she's loved bags and purses since she was about three years old and used to take her mom's purses and grocery bags and put her toys in them. <laughs> she always takes time to cook delicious, healthy meals for our family. But my favorite thing about her is how she tucks me in at night and reads to me and prays for me. So Elevation Church, all over the world, let's welcome my mom, Holly Furtick. Woo, 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 woo. Miss Holly in the house. Miss Holly in the house. Okay. It's not a lot of people, but the, the, the 10 who are here really love this. <laughs> I'm going to sit down in a minute, I promise, but you've got something exciting coming up, and I wanted to make sure the entire yes. church family knew about it, so share it. Okay, so um, this Wednesday, I am starting a live open enrollment of Mrs. Better Half. It's a Bible study that I wrote several years ago. It's actually something that was sort of... Um, birth out of our house. Exactly. I was going to say Where that. Where is that? I oh, watch her welcome all of these um, women <laughs> into our home. I had to take the kids and I don't remember we would go to a movie or go to uh, what's that restaurant? Highway 55. And we would bug out while she would teach the women the study. Remember the house would always be full of women and she'd be teaching them about being a wife and not really trying to lecture, but just sharing from experience. So I had one group and then yes. another group and then another group. <laughs> and then the team was like you should do this as an actual study. And yeah. You, from my perspective, you're too humble sometimes. So you're like, well, I don't do Bible studies. And, and then you did it. And God has used it in a great way. And we were taking a walk uh, uh, the other day. And I said, people right now 
that either if they're quarantined or if they're just like they've been spent too much time with people that they're with, you should do Becoming Mrs. Better Half study for the whole world and do it on Facebook Live and, and, and do it each week. And so she committed to do that. And I think it's going to be absolutely amazing to share this with our family at this really time excited. with our church family. I'm really excited. So it's going to be live every Wednesday night on Facebook. And um, all you have to do to be a part is completely free is go to hollyfurtick.com and register because it is a Facebook group. So it's not just like open to everyone. It's a group. So you have to ask to be a part of the group and we will let you in. And um, you don't need a book. We, um, some people will have a book, but we'll have a digital copy of the book available for you within the Facebook group. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of nervous about it, but I'm also really excited. All right, if, you, if you're coming to the study, say I'm in in the chat so she can know she's not going to be better half an hour. Know. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> And you can jump in this Wednesday. If you're watching this later, you can jump in uh, later on as well. Completely free. Our gift to you during this time. Yeah. Reach the word. You look amazing. Thank you. You are amazing. Thank you. I mean that. And I thank God that God gave you a husband that cleans up as well as me. I love you. You look good. Come on, my Reach God. The word. Come on, let's give it up for Holly. So that was very special, guys. I want I wanted to go on record and let everyone know that it was Elijah's idea to, for them to dress up and wear suits. And so not his dad. And his dad said, yes, let's do it. And Graham said, um, <laughs> are we sure we want to do that? And um, guys, thank you. Thank you for dressing up and being here at Abby. Thank you for introducing me. That was so special. I love you guys. I love you too, everybody watching. Hi. Um, before I start, I I have to say my my piece about the blessing because I am just continually amazed. I don't know if you are, but I just can't seem to get used to the fact that God is continually using this church and this ministry all across the world. I love how almost every video showcases people who are part of the Elevation family all over the world and the music, the freaking music. Can I say that? God is taking these songs that my husband and Chris and our Elevation worship team have written and he is using them to bring hope and peace during such a crazy time of uncertainty. I, I, what I can't believe is that we get to hear them first. So whether you're in the building or you're watching online, we get to hear these songs first. They're birthed here and they're sung here and the blessing, all those people that were singing the blessing, we got to sing it here first on this stage. And I, I don't, I'm, I've never had a song that gets me every time like that one does. And I can't seem to listen to it enough. Yesterday I was um, walking down this greenway and I was listening and I was like, I was, I think I was by myself, but I was like lifting my hands and I was singing. And I have to say personally, my favorite part of the blessing, the live version that's on the Elevation album, Graves in the Gardens, if you don't have it, you're dumb. Um, but my favorite part of my favorite part, babe, is when you say, you take the stage. Do you know what I'm about to say? And he comes up and you know, everybody's singing and it's, you want it to go into the, the blessing one more time. And he goes, put another blessing on him, Carrie. <laughs> do you know how to do that? It's my favorite part. So anyway, um, thank you, Pastor Stephen for pushing so hard and writing such incredible songs in Elevation Worship, wherever you guys went. Um, you are blessing us in this season. So happy Mother's Day, it's my turn to say happy Mother's Day to all of the ladies who are watching. My mom is watching. I love you, mom. Um, <laughs> this year, I sent my mom a beautiful little framed print of a church, and the title of the print was called <laughs> Soul. And I wrote a little <laughs> letter and told her to, um, that I was grateful my husband for, her for raising me in the though. church. Um, some of my earliest memories are at that. church, and it's now the thing that I've chosen to give my life to. So thank you, Mom, for planting those seeds in me. I love you. Um, I also feel like Mother's Day is a day to celebrate all women. A woman's touch is yeah. a beautiful thing in this I world. Know. And so I also want to take the opportunity to say to all of the ladies under the sound of my voice that I honor you today. 
Hey, and hey. Thank you for hey, loving hey. and nurturing and caring for all of those that God has placed in your life. I love that they use that scripture, Proverbs 31, where it says, her children rise up and call her blessed. And I hope that everyone watching today will take a moment to reach out to a few women. I mean, I know you've already reached out to your mom, but if you'll take a minute to reach out to a few women who've impacted your life today and just say send out a couple teacher, of Mother's Day cards to some of my friends and let them know how they have impacted some people that God laid on my life. heart you know, along I with our like, special Mother's Day stuff. I feel like these past two months have been particularly hard on the women and so I want to take a second to honor some of the hero moms that I feel like need to be shouted out today okay so shout out to the mom whose kids cannot fix their own cereal. Ah! If that's you, just type it in the chat. Yes, Lord. And we all salute you. All of our moms whose kids can fix their own cereal. We, we're sorry that you're still in that stage, but we shout you out. Shout out to the mom who thought she had an empty nest, but all your adult children came back to invade what would have been a very peaceful quarantine for you, and you're cooking food for an army of people. If that's you, type yes, Lord, in the chat, okay? Um, shout out to the mom whose kids cannot read the directions that were sent to them by their teacher. If that's you, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just say yes, Lord, and we will, we will, we will give our blessings to you and call you our hero. Um, this one's for me. I'm shouting myself out. Shout out to the moms of teenage boys who cannot get enough to eat. Uh. <laughs> Our boys do not accept cereal for dinner as an answer. Cereal is like a post-dinner pre-dessert thing in our house. A box of cereal lasts one day. And poor Abby, you guys, poor Abby, she's going to have some serious food issues because she's always hiding food in her room. Oh my gosh, I used to have to do that. <laughs> And my mom only, when we were growing up, it was just me and my brother, and I used to have to hide food, y'all, all the time. There was there was no food left, and my husband went to get seconds, and he was like, guys, where's where's the, I'm telling you, the, the food is an issue in our house. Um, shout out to all the working moms out there, because I cannot tell you how many Zoom calls I've been in where a mom is walking a baby, or kids come in and interrupt. Um, I'm also um, shouting myself out on this one because my kids just come in the room. Like, they don't check to see, they don't listen at the door to see if you're, like, talking to yourself or anything. They just walk in the room talking to you. Anybody, any working moms out there, you feel my pain. Um, Abby came into my office the other day, and I was on a Zoom call, and she was, like, the fourth person that interrupted me and my husband wasn't one of them I mean they just kept coming in to the room and she comes in and I turned around and I was so done and I looked at her like what? and she goes you obviously don't want to talk to me right now and she stopped out of the room like I was the one who was being rude anyone out there with me on this okay Shout out to the moms of the kids who have special needs. I just want to say your sacrifice wow, is an yeah. example to all of us, and you are a hero. And one last time, one last shout out. Shout out to all the moms who have missed milestones these past few months, whether it was a graduation or the birth of a grandchild or even a wedding. I am I'm so sorry, and I'm praying that God would multiply back to you everything that you have missed during this season. Ladies, wherever you are, whatever stage of life you're in, you're doing better than you think you are. That is one of my favorite lines from a Stephen Furtick sermon. How many of you want another Throwback Thursday? I want another Throwback Thursday, and I'm calling for them to play my husband's sermon, the most encouraging message you've never heard. And um, it's a word for all the moms because you are doing better than you think you are. And I'm praying over you today that no matter what this Mother's Day is like for you, that you would feel encouraged and that you would feel comforting. Am I losing the guys out there? They're like, hello. Um, <laughs> I promise that my message is for everyone today. And I'm, I'm about to get to it. So right now, um, I'm really excited to bring this word today. I have the privilege of speaking about my sermons for a lot longer than Pastor Stephen does. He has an average of six days. 
And I, on the other hand, have the ability to just gather, 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 mentally think about, what is I preach? What I want to preach about? Yes. So the sermon that I'm bringing you today, I actually started taking down little notes on it in October. Wow. And so I feel like everything came together this week as I've been preparing, and I'm really excited about what God has to say to us today. So will you pray with me before we get started? God, first of all, I just want to lift up all the women under the sound of my voice. And I pray for those who have lost their mom. I pray for those who want to be a mom, and I pray that you would comfort them today, God. I pray for the woman that is tired, that you would encourage her today. And God, I'm just so thankful for all of the women in my life who have impacted me and encouraged me and prayed for me and pushed me, and I'm just so grateful for their touch in my life. And so now, Lord, would you speak to us? We are listening. Our ears are open. You are such a good God, and we count it a privilege every time that we get to open up your word and hear your voice. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. If you have a Bible, will you turn to John 6, 28? Um, In the book of John, Jesus makes seven statements. And last month... um, when I preached, I talked about there's seven I am statements. And last month when I preached, I talked about when Jesus said, I am the way. Today, I want to go back and talk about the very first I am statement that Jesus presented to his followers. And that is, I am the bread of life. To me, this is perhaps the best description Jesus could have given himself. Do I have any other fellow bread lovers out there? <laughs> I love bread. I love bread. I think sourdough is my favorite, but really any warm bread with butter on it, and I will throw any diet out the window. Bread, it gives, it gives comfort, and it, and it gives fullness, and it represents life and sustenance. And today I want to show you how when Jesus shows up in your life, he starts often with the things that he can do for you, but he wants to move you in a space of who he can be to you. All right, so let's look at John chapter 6, verse 28. We're going to pick up just after Jesus has performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000. And here's what it says. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you. What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Today, I want to talk to you about moving past miracles. My title is More Than Miracles. Several weeks ago, Pastor Stephen started this series called Looking Forward to Normal, and this series has just been mind-blowing to me. I feel like Every week, he comes with the exact words that I didn't even know that I was needing to hear. Like, he's on this special tap with the Holy Spirit that just goes right into my soul. And ever since he began this idea of looking forward to normal, I've been reading the Bible differently. And I've been seeing that all throughout Jesus' teachings, he was actually trying to get the people to look forward to normal, but they had such a hard time with this. And in this particular passage of Scripture, we find the crowds coming to Jesus and expecting him to repeat the miracles of Moses and actually physically lead them out of Roman oppression. But Jesus came to do so much more than that. He came to bring a new life. He came to bring a living hope. He came yeah, to bring a that we would freedom do the same. that went so far beyond their physical <laughs> captivity. He came to bring them a relationship with the living God that would go so far beyond their traditional religion of following the law and making sacrifices. The problem with this is that the people could not see beyond what they thought the Messiah would do, and they were disappointed. 
Have you ever been disappointed because following God didn't turn out the way that you thought it would? I mean, we've all been there. Maybe you've asked God for something and he didn't do it. Maybe you thought God would change something in your life and he still hasn't done it. It's easy for me to stand here and tell you when God doesn't do something for you, it's because he has something that he wants to do in you. Yeah. And it's harder to believe that when you can't get past why God didn't do the thing. That yeah. Y'all, I cannot place. wait until I have just a beautiful okay, art studio in our new home. It's I'm going to pause this real quick. Has been I cannot wait until, I mean, I can't wait. I, God spoke to me the other day to just live and be in this moment and to not, to not move past this, but to be here in this moment, to remember it because you will never be here again. So this humble beginning that I have right now on this temporary basement floor of, you know, a friend's house, um, I know that God has called me to do exactly what it is that I am doing and so much more. And I'm going to continue and I encourage you to continue as we're even listening to Holly speak right now. And as I'm painting, working on a piece for a client, I'm enjoying my time and just allowing the word of God to just speak to me. And I just want to say to you, whether you're watching now or a month from now or what have you. I just want to say that enjoy your time where you are and allow God to work everything out. My mom always tells me that if you're always praying for God's will to be done, don't you think that he's going to allow his will to be done? And we don't know exactly what God's will is. We don't know every full detail. So we must trust in God to just guide us and to lead us and right now in the humble beginnings that i'm right here man i i just daydream about that art studio that god i know that god's gonna bless me with it he's given me the vision of what to sketch out how to set it up what to do what this space is for it's not just for me to just create art but it's for you and all the words that God will give. Jaleesa Miller Creative Ministries. Hey, y'all. Hey. All right, let's get back to this. One of the most disappointing experiences of my life. Now, don't get me wrong. It's also been, guys, sorry. It's also been one of the most amazing experiences of my life. But it just didn't turn out the way that I imagined that it was. You see, I wanted to be a mom from from the very beginning. From my earliest memories, I loved playing with dolls as a little girl. I loved playing house with my sisters. I always fought at, to be the mom, and my older sister Emily would be the dad. And I'm ashamed to say that sometimes we would make our little sister Joy play the dog. Sorry, Joy. Um, but even as I grew up, I loved babysitting, and I loved working in my church nursery, and. When I married the man of my dreams, I wanted to start a family right away. My husband helped me off for a couple of years because he was um, smarter than me. And finally, I got pregnant at the mature age of 24. And this beautiful baby was placed into my arms. And guys, when I tell you that he came out crying, he came out screaming. And my mom was 24 when she got pregnant with me. Like for five years. He did not stop. And the doctors and the nurses would come into our hospital room and they'd say, wow, he's got a great set of lungs. We thought that was a compliment. Magical um, lungs. It's code husband. for your baby's crying really Thank you, loud. baby. And then we took him home and he kept crying. And then I started crying. And nothing was the way Smells that I spicy. thought. I have a meme that I want to show you. Um, this is what you thought motherhood would be like versus what it's actually like. This, this, this one really ministered to my soul. This baby came out and there were no flowers. The, 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 this wasn't the way that I pictured it, but the problem wasn't the baby. The problem was my expectations of him. Babies cry. They, did you get some of this? Do. And so I started asking God to make him stop crying. And God wanted to draw me closer to him. 
And God was building an inner strength in me that I would need for every stage that would follow. So much of what I dreamed about when it came to being a mom was actually based on my ego. Mm. Sorry, this isn't turning out to be the most comforting Mother's Day message, is it? That's not the thing that we want to hear on Mother's Day. But I had to realize, and I'm still 14 years later learning this, that raising kids is mostly about releasing your expectations and embracing who God has created them to be. Have you ever been disappointed because something didn't turn out the way you thought it would? I think we all feel that way about 2020. God, this is not the way I pictured this going. And that's how the Jewish people felt in John 6. They had spent 400 years waiting for the promised Messiah. They had memorized the Old Testament prophecies and they had built up in their mind what they thought the Messiah would do when he finally came to rescue them. So here they are under Roman rule, and they do themselves much like the Israelites when they were under Egyptian slavery. They even had this prophecy that said that the Messiah would call, call down manna from heaven like Moses had. So can you imagine their excitement when Jesus does this miracle and he feeds the 5,000 and the people thought, this is it, this is him. This is the man who's going to start a revolution and lead us to freedom. And so they chase Jesus down the very next day. And they say to him, look at what it says in verse 30. They say, what sign will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. But Jesus was trying to get them to look forward to a new normal. He wanted them to see that, yes, he is the Messiah. And yes, he does miracles. And let me just say, God delights in showing up in miraculous ways. And God still does miracles. He's our heavenly father. And he loves you. He loves it when you pray about your job and your children and your finances. He loves to show up in your life and make a way when there seems to be no way. He gave them bread. He, He satisfied their physical needs. But that is not where he stops. And the beautiful thing about following Jesus is that he offers so much more than just meeting our physical needs. Amen. And so he begins to teach them. And he wants them to understand that he's offering more than just physical bread that goes into your belly. That he is the bread who has come down from heaven. He tells them, I am all that you need. I am the one who satisfies the hunger in your soul. I am the bread of life. They wanted Jesus to fit within their formula of religion. But Jesus came to completely change everything. The old standard was works and sacrifices and following the law. The new standard is simple. Faith and belief and an actual living breathing relationship with the God of the universe. That was better. What matters most in the Christian life? If we could just get this today, this is the thing I want you to get. What matters most in the Christian life is not what Jesus can do for you. Yes, he still does miracles, but what matters most is who he is to you. Maybe you know Jesus is the one who provides physically, but have you moved to knowing him as the one who satisfies your soul? Because I'm standing here today and telling you that that is a real thing in my life. He is the one that satisfies my soul. So what does this look like practically? Because it's great to talk about how Jesus is the bread of life, but what does that mean in your everyday life? You all knew I used to be a teacher for three very long years of my life. Is it all right if I teach you a little bit today? I want to teach you about what it looks like to access this bread of life, this bread that Christ offers to us. And I would like to dedicate this sermon to my low-carb eating husband and all of his keto friends out there. Bread is biblical. So this sermon is dedicated to all of you. The first thing that we need to do before we can identify what the bread looks like in our everyday life is we need to figure out what it is not. Jesus said, I 
am the bread of life. He even quotes to them from their prophecy in Isaiah 55, verse 2 says, why eat, what, the prophecy says, why spend money on what is not bread and labor your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. It's important that us, that we identify the things in our life that are not bread. Mm. One day this week, I uh, saw, I came out of my office from having a meeting and I saw that Graham ate Cocoa Puffs for lunch. Cocoa Puffs are not an adequate lunch. Cocoa Puffs are gonna fill you up for about an hour and then leave you coming back for more junk that does not nourish your body. And I got to thinking, are there any Cocoa Puff Christians out there? Are there any things in your life that are not nourishing you, but you keep going back for it? Maybe it's a habit that you just can't seem to stop doing. Maybe it's an offense that has caused you to become bitter and kind of blocked you from experiencing what God wants you to experience in your life. Maybe it's a person who always pulls you away from the things that you know that God is trying to do in your life. Here's one for me, gossip. Proverbs 26, 22 gets me so good every time it says the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down into the innermost parts. Have you ever noticed how it feels good to talk about someone in the moment? But it's like kind of like those garlicky breadsticks. They feel good going down, but then later you start to worry that maybe you went too far. And then deep down, I don't know if there's any like overanalyzers out there, but deep down you start to wonder if the person that you were gossiping to will trust you less because they're like, well, if she would talk about them to me, she might talk about me to them. I need to get past that one quickly. Sometimes I buy things that I don't need to impress people who aren't even looking. I need to keep moving. Sometimes I depend on others around me to fill me. What a heavy burden to place on the people that God has placed in my life. Spiritual bread can never come from another person, good or bad, because any time that you try to find nourishment from an earthly person, you will be disappointed because people are imperfect. People will always let you down. People have their own flaws and their own failures. And if you think that your spouse or your child or your friendship will fill you, you will ultimately be let down. Sometimes God does use others to fill us. Of course he does. God speaks to me through the amazing people that he's placed in my life, but you can't get it backwards. You can't confuse the source. He is our bread. And if he chooses to speak through to me through a person in my life, it's still the Holy Spirit who's comforting me, not that person. Amen. When he is my bread. I know where to go when I feel let down. So what does the bread look like? If that's what it's not, what is it? What does it look like? First of all, bread is now. If you've ever eaten stale bread, it's not good. My mom used to take me to the store called the Day Old Bread Store. At least that's what she <laughs> called it. Anybody ever go to the Day Old Bread Store? <laughs> One day is okay, but stale bread is not good. When you know Jesus, you know that he speaks right now Amen. to your situation. Amen. Sometimes he only gives How you enough to stay it, for a moment. Sometimes for a day. The Bible tells us that his mercies are new every morning because they aren't meant to last forever. They're meant to make you coming back to him for more and for more. What if you had a relationship with someone that you never spoke to? That wouldn't be much of a relationship. God has a fresh word that can sustain you moment to moment. It's now he gives you a word in season proverbs 15 yeah. 23 says a word spoken in due season how good it is back in march god led me to psalm 23 i didn't know why i just started reading it and then coronavirus came and it became my anthem for the next several months i read it over and over again i read it in different versions i shared it with everyone because it was getting me through all of the emotions and the uncertainties of quarantine it was a word in season for me jeremiah 15 16 says this let me find it when your words came i ate them they were my joy and my heart's delight. 
You don't need signs anymore. Maybe a sign or a miracle brought you to Christ. But mature faith doesn't need constant signs and wonders. Sometimes God doesn't get you out of a situation because he wants you to go through. But he is going to give you everything that you need to push through. And he's going to go through it with you. And you're going to come out on the other side stronger. Mature faith knows that the bread is right there in front of them right now in this moment. Right now, I just have to access it. I just have to open my eyes. His bread is also normal. So often we think that coming to God means that he has to always speak to us in this big thunderous clap or like the writing in, on the wall. I think that's a Bible verse somewhere. Like, the, I don't know, God wrote on a wall. People use that phrase a lot. Um, <laughs> or maybe, maybe we think, oh, I don't need writing on the wall, but God mostly speaks to me at church. Look, don't get me wrong. God speaks to me at church. God speaks to me through the songs and the sermons that come out of Elevation Church. No doubt about that. But God is not limited to songs and sermons. Same that. And I wonder if Say one of the that. reasons that, that, that we hear God speak to us when we're at church is because we come expecting it. Amen. Hey, hey girl, you speaking. God in the expecting God to yes. When yes. I expected God to speak to me through every mundane moment. God can speak words of encouragement to you the moment that you open your eyes in the morning. God can whisper words of peace to you while you lie awake at night. God can speak directly to you when you open up his word. You know you can read the Bible when you're not at church, right? Amen. And you don't have to start in a weird place. Start with what you know. Start with Psalm 23. Start with the Lord's Prayer. Start where you know that God will speak to you right there. Remember a few weeks ago when Pastor Stephen told us, faith is not a lever that you pull. I, I will never forget that. He said, we don't worship jackpot Jesus. Faith is a lens. And when I decide to open my eyes and see God at work all around me, my perspective changes. And all of a sudden, I see him showing up in all the small moments of life. It's normal. It's now. And you know what else? It's a new Amen. You all, I want to thank you for tuning in with me today. Actually, I got to do this the proper way. I have to set this back up. There we go. Okay. I want to thank you all for tuning in with me today. Um, this is just for you to see some behind the scenes of what it's like with me on a day. Um, I've been painting now for a little over an hour. And this is a very large piece. Of course, I'm not going to finish it today, but I actually got a lot done and I'm really loving it so far. Um, but please tune in to Painting in the Word this week on Thursday and share this video, subscribe and like. Uh, when you subscribe, ding the bell, the notification thing, so that you'll, you'll get to see when we go live, when we do special things. Um, I'm going to be doing a whole lot more stuff. We have our online paint parties right now. We will have some themed parties that are coming up. We will have a couple's date night coming up. And we will have um, a Father's Day special as well. So just stay tuned in. Make sure that you follow us on Facebook at Imagine Me Paint Parties. That's where I make a lot of our announcements of the things we have going on in our sales and everything. And if you want to have a private session with me, just send me a message. It's as simple as that, sending me a message. I love you all. I hope that you've been encouraged today. If you want to finish listening to this message, it is the Mother's Day message from Holly. Well, you might as well come say hi now. I'm not already saying hi behind the screen. They can't see you. They can't see my reflection. No. In my shadow. Oh, well, you see that right there was my husband. He said he's saying hi. <laughs> it's time to go. It is time to go. <laughs> we got things to do. <laughs> I love you all. Have a beautiful day.